Hi, and welcome to this week's Ask EMBN, where we'll be talking about travel sizing and how to make your e-bike more efficient. Now remember, if you've got any questions for us to simply put them hashtag Ask EMBN, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to you on the next show. Adam Kelly, after getting back into riding via e-mountain bikes, Marida E16800, with a great bike, I'm now riding every day mostly on the gravel trails around home as part of commuting and going to the shops, etc. Obviously this isn't mountain biking, but can you give me some tips for setting up the bike to be more efficient for that type of riding while still being capable on proper trails? Wow, that's, uh, you want your cake and eat it, uh, Adam. That's quite difficult. I think you're gonna make your bike more efficient at commuting, very straightforward, uh, you're right, just maybe put more air pressure, not on your shock, but actually in your tires. So go up to maybe kind of 40, 50 PSI. You might want to think about changing your tires on your bike from, I think on the Merida E160s, there's 2.8 Minion DHR. So maybe go down to something which is a semi-slick and a harder compound tire as well. And that way you're going to get a lot more uh, life out of your battery. What you talk about uh, air pressure in your fork and your shock, you actually talk about shock, you need to make sure if you're gonna put more air pressure in your shock that you balance that with the front as well so the bike sits correctly. But to try and do the two, uh, maybe you should think about getting a shock with a lockout on it and uh, that would be easier. But uh, I don't think you can do, you can't get a really efficient bike at commuting and a trail riding on technical terrain, I'm afraid. Um, next up from Sarah Dobb. Uh, Hi guys, uh, I want to ride like you. If I don't want to ride like me, maybe you want to ride like Chris. Uh, as I've never done any of the red routes before, should I just go for it and learn or, or do I go and do a course? How do you guys learn? Well, EMBN has got a ton of videos on, on riding skills, but I think you're dead right. I think maybe a trail center is a great place to go and learn and maybe you can start off with, you know, with, the, with, the, with the blues and progress to reds and then onto the blacks. And um, I think it's just it's just about more time in your bike, just you know, learning things bit by bit by bit. So yeah, more time in your bike, the better you're gonna be, become. But uh, in the meantime, check out one of a load of videos that we've done here on different riding skills. When you first swing your leg over an e-bike, a lot of people think they're slow, sluggish, not very responsive, especially if you come across from a lightweight trail mountain bike. But it's all possible on the e-bike. Today's video is gonna show you transferring those skills from your trail bike across to your e-bike. Lars Bjorgen, um, hope I pronounced your name correctly there, Lars. Uh, about cassette or no cassette, the chain on my high bike or Mountain Pro X, the Robot from CX, great bike, is down to 0 0.075, but not quite reaching the 0.1 mark. Once and for all, what is the definite advice regarding chain and cassette wear? Change both chain and cassette every time, or two chains per cassette? Well, I've actually talked to my colleague Doddy, who's hot on the subject, uh, and like he mentioned, it's all down about the, how much power you've got uh, through your legs, what the terrain you ride, obviously, you know, siltier, sandier terrain is gonna weigh a chain more, uh, and actually the type of chain you've got. So Doddy reckons that you need to replace it before 0 0.075, uh, so the sooner the better to get more out of your cassette and your terrain. So uh, here's what Doddy says in the video just down here. Now having a chain checker is a really good thing to have because it's sometimes possible to get two or three chains worth of use out of one cassette if you make sure that you replace your chain before it's completely worn out. The reason for that is the chain will minutely stretch over its time on the bike. And basically all that means is it will be contacting different parts of your sprockets than what it's designed to. And of course that will make it wear out those sprockets. So what you're looking for is using a chain checker such as this, there's a few different types on the market. It indicates the amount of stretch on there. If it's above 0.75, you basically, you've got to replace that chain immediately. That's really, really worn. And at the same time, you're going to need to replace the cassette as well, sadly. If you've got 10 or few gears on your bike, say 7, 8, 9, or 10 speed transmission, you can go up to 0.75. That's your roof of where you need to replace it. If you've got 11 or more gears, it's 0.5 when you should replace it. Audrey Buryokov, uh, I want to use my bike for small overnight adventures around Oslo, Norway. Great idea. Go someplace, camp there, return the next day. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. On the one hand, a hardtail can carry more camping gear. On the other hand, full suspension is more comfortable. I do not normally do all those jumps and stunts, but I will go off-road and need to carry a tent sleeping bag and sleeping bag. <laughs> Would you recommend to go for a hardtail or a full suspension? Um, Audrey, yeah, 
bikes. You know, that's what e-bikes is all about, is little adventures like that. Myself and Doddy did one in the summer where he got five star and I stayed in a field with some sheep and just, just a sleeping bag. So I guess it depends how much kit you want to carry because you can go super, super lightweight. Um, when it comes to the choice of hardtail or full suspension, well, that really depends on um, on the type of full suspension bike you go. Because if you've got a lockout on your full suspension, that really doesn't make much difference, to be honest with you. Uh, in terms of the space, um, I guess there's loads of uh, bike packing kit which you can get. Uh, I, I, I really don't think it matters what type of bike you got. I think it's all about that spirit of getting out there and exploring. And I think just working it out and trying to kind of narrow it down to the essentials that you need to take with you. So, you know, the less kit, the better. I mean, I've, um, do you know what? I've read quite a lot of climbing books recently and it's incredible how lightweight those guys go when they're on like the north face of the Eiger and stuff like that. So, um, however, in the meantime, we, as I said, me and Doddy did a camping piece back in the summer and this is what we packed for our trip. What does it take to prepare for a multi-day e-bike trip? Is it simply a case of a credit card and some chewing gum to replace a toothbrush? Let's take a look. Now, this is a question we've had in from Grez D2. Uh, two questions. First one is, how about 29 plus tires for an e-bike? Uh, that would be definitely a hoot to ride. What are your thoughts? Do you ever rode anything with that wheel size? And the second question is, what are your thoughts on conversion kits to turn your existing bike into an e-bike? Uh, I don't know the answer to the first question. I've not ridden 29 plus. I can imagine those are monumentally big. And the problem with those kind of tires is, I mean, they are, they are good. They definitely cushion you from any impacts and you know rocks and roots on the terrain. But when it comes to cornering, the problem is when you when you run the kind of pressures that a lot of people recommend at sub 20 pound, they they do tend to they tend to let, let lose their support in corners. So. Um, I think 29 tire by itself, 20, say a 29 2.6 or 2.8 is ample. I think if you're saying, suggesting it's gonna be bigger than that, I'm not so sure. But uh, yeah, if you, for example, our Canyon Spectral Ons have got 2.8 um, Maxxis Minion DHRs in the back and, uh, and up front is a 2.5 and that's probably big enough. And your second question uh, with regards to converting your mountain bike to an e-bike, um, there's loads of kits out there from uh, Paradox Hermes, you've got Bafang. I mean, Bafang have got like a BBS 01 and a BBS 02 and a BBS HD. Now they range from 250 watts up to 750 watts. Um, We've also had kits from Lyft MTB in France here. So there's loads on the market. Uh, we're actually got a video coming up in the next week on uh, fitting a aftermarket uh, e-bike motor to your bike. So keep an eye out for that and that'll explain everything you need to know about converting your bike. Ian Wright is asking a question about suspension. Um, uh, Ian says, I'm in the market to upgrade my suspension. Do I look at the same manufacturer as the ones fitted or branch out? I'm concerned with the rear suspension shock length mainly as the front fork seem to be more standard. So uh, when it comes to upgrading, uh, I'd like to probably know what fork and shock absorber you've got on the back to start with. Um, the, I mean, the good the good brands out there obviously are RockShox, Fox, Manitou, you know, they make some really good kits. So if you do do that, I would definitely pair the front with the back. Uh, because it comes down to a different company's philosophy on how how they um, make their damping. Um, yeah, you're concerned about your shock length. I mean, your shock length is your shock length, basically. You cannot go fitting a different shock length to your bike simply because it's going to alter the geometry and it's not going to make the, handle, the bike handle as well as it should do. For example, if you put a shock that's longer in there, it's going to heighten the bottom bracket. And uh, that, what that, the effect that has is makes the bike handle really poorly in the corners. At the same time, if you put a shock in there that's too short, uh, you have the danger of your bottom bracket being too low and therefore your cranks hitting the ground. And finally, Oliver Hawkins, uh, I'm getting the new 2019 Levo. I, however, I'm six foot. I am in between the large and extra large. Uh, no, I'd actually go for the extra large. The large reach is only 455. I think you are both around my height. What size do you guys ride on the new 2019 Levo? What do you recommend? Right, I've ridden both of them in every model. Uh, I can actually, I'd probably go towards the extra large if you're six foot, simply because 
if you feel it's a little bit too big, and I don't think it is too big, I think you can simply lower the uh, stem in the steerer, put that, slam that down onto the head tube, and then slide the seat further forward. I think XL for a six foot rider is bang on. However, you could ride an L if you wanted to. The problem I find with a lot of riders, they, they tend to base their judgments on the bikes they've had before, and sometimes if they've got older bikes, then when you move up to a new bike, you find it's a little bit too big, but I think it just comes to, um, you, you become accustomed to the size of your bike. Like I said earlier, my, you know, my wife rides an extra large Levo because she's actually used to riding bigger bikes and she doesn't find it uh, uh, awkward at all. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, extra large. Thanks for your questions this week, folks. Don't forget to send us in more of your questions by hashtagging AskEMBN. Uh, if you want to see uh, more videos out of the workshop and out of the studio, check out our electric mountain bike adventure, which we did recently. Uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget you can like, share, and subscribe to EMBN.